Hello, I'm Minister Timothy Jones, and welcome to Fellowship in the Word. The title of this ministry is Fellowship in the Word because we believe that the Word is so important that it is an essential component to your walk with Christ. So today's title is The Power of What Has Been Written. The Power of What Has Been Written. If we think about the times that we're living in, people are coming up with words to try to encourage and motivate. People are writing self-help books and giving you all of their theories and motivations when everything that we need is inside of the Word of God. And this is what happens when we call ourselves Christians without a full developing hunger and understanding of the Scripture. I want to begin by going to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I encourage you to read verses 1 through 9 because that section is entitled Perilous Times and Perilous Men. But I want to highlight verses 5 and 7. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. Verse 7. And always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. What is the power that is being denied? That's being referenced in verse 5. And what is the knowledge of the truth that they are never able to come to? If we go to Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. John 14, 6. And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So the power in Romans 1 and 16 is the power of God for salvation. There are too many people within church proclaiming to be part of the body of Christ. There are too many people who are developing their own routes and presenting forms of godliness, but denying its power. The scriptures tell us to test the spirit to see if it's of God. And so if anyone is presenting a word, if anyone is presenting a form of godliness that does not include Jesus Christ as the risen Savior and the power through him, for us to be saved, then that is a form of godliness and denying his power. When we reflect back on verse 7 in 2 Timothy chapter 3, where it says, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Jesus makes it clear when he said in John 14, 6, that I am the way, the truth. So think about how many people are presenting different routes to God. People are presenting themselves as God in various forms. We worship the created instead of the creator. And so that's an example of always coming into the learning. You have people who are earning degrees and creating doctrines and teachings. And so people are becoming learned, but they're not coming into the knowledge of the truth because the truth is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. The Lord has impressed upon me to say with certainty that it is impossible to fully embrace the power that is true godliness without a continual and comprehensive intake of the word of God. We always encourage people to make sure that you join a church that is Bible teaching. And that's great. But there are 168 hours in a week. If you spend three of them at church on a Sunday, that is not in and of itself enough word to sustain you 
for the other 165 hours that are in that week. Nobody goes through 168 hours in the physical only eating for three hours. So why do you think that you can operate and be effective in your spirit, man, if you're not feeding yourself the word of God, if you're not growing in your understanding of the word of God? Let's continue to build more facts. And one thing that I love about the Believers Worship Center and Fellowship in the Word is that if you have been watching and following, more times than not, Scripture is substantiated with Scripture. Yes, as a minister, the Holy Spirit will give us words to be able to explain and elaborate and give application. But that proof that sustains is taking scripture and then going to more scripture that brings it together. So when the Holy Spirit brings to our remembrance, it's bringing to our remembrance the word of God. So if we are not constantly growing in our consumption of the word of God, then what does the Holy Spirit have to remind us of? Because that prefix re means to repeat. If you were in school, you remember before the test, the teacher may do a review. And so the Holy Spirit is bringing to our remembrance in each and every situation scriptures that will help us not only be in a position to sustain ourselves, but be in a position to share a word with someone else. So to further elaborate on the power of what has been written, let's go to John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word and God, one in the same. So the more that we grow and understand the scriptures, the more that we will grow in our knowledge and understanding of who God is. John 14, 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father? And the Father in me, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Pay attention if you break down John 14, 10. Jesus is saying that the words that he speaks are not of his own authority, but they are God the Father. But he ends it by saying, but the father who dwells in me does the work. So God does works as manifestations and movement off of his word. So why try to come up with words and try to use your emotion to create and often fabricate a move of God when you simply speak the word? Because God has to move off of his word. God doesn't have to move off of your emotions. So when we grow in our understanding and we go through these trials and tribulations of life, we have to be able to speak the word to any and every situation. And God will move off of his word because we live in the dispensation of the New Testament. I love my pastor. I have an amazing pastor, but I have the Holy Spirit inside of me. And because I've been walking with my pastor as a shepherd and a father, that I know that I can speak the word and God is going to move. And then if I'm led, I can let him know about what happened. And then oftentimes when I get to church on Sunday, God will speak off the word that is being delivered and then further confirm what word that I had. And, that's the, and the word is the only thing that can do that. There is no other book, there is no other manuscript, there is no other commentary, no theologians, papers that can touch the power and the anointing of the word of God. It is living. And we're going to go to a scripture that proves that because sometimes we present 
the word out of context and it almost sounds as cliche. So that's why throughout this teaching, you're going to get scripture after scripture so that you can follow along and understand the power of what has been written. There's no greater example of this than going to Matthew chapter 4. Verses 1 through 11 is where Satan is tempting Jesus. I'm going to read verses 4, 7, 10, and 11. Once again, this is Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4, 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Matthew 4, 7. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Matthew 4.10. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. I've gone through this a number of times, but this is also the power of what has been written that you'll get revelation that's unique to the moment that you are studying. Can you imagine? Jesus has fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus is operating in the flesh. So he is subject to everything that we go through in this body. And in verse 10, away with you, Satan. He's Jesus. He's the son of God expressing a level of frustration and anger. But I believe Satan moved because after Jesus expressed his emotion away with you, Satan, for it is written. And so when he says, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve, that I believe God moved and Satan had to depart. So think about how many times we stop with our emotional response and don't follow it up with, for it is written. We get into arguments with our spouses. We may get into arguments and situations with our children and our friends, and we'll express emotion and we'll try to give logic to the emotion. The scriptures tell us to be angry but sin not because Jesus knew. I believe in this moment, Jesus was probably angry. But even then, he immediately came back to himself, for it is written. So the fight is not ours. It's the Lord's. And so the fight is not ours. Use the word of God. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Once again, the power in the word of God. In the natural, when you begin to divide something, you're actually making it smaller. So if you actually start to divide something, you potentially could be making it weaker because you're separating it. Not when it comes to the word of God. So we're saying here, rightly, dividing the word of truth. So to rightly divide means that I am giving the portion that is needed specifically for a time such as this. And so it's the word of truth. And then we remember we said where Jesus, we read the scripture in John 14, where Jesus said, I am the truth. We read John 1, where it said the word was with God and the word was God. So now here in 2 Timothy 2.15, we're being instructed to rightly divide the word of truth. I hope you are seeing the continual parallels between Jesus, God, and the word. John 15.7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Verse 8, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So when we break John 15, 7 down, 
If you abide in me, Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. So we're abiding in Christ. But what does he say after that? And my words abide in you. Do you have God's word inside of you? In Psalms 119, it says, I will hide the word in my heart so that I won't sin against you. If you have the word inside of your heart, if the word of God is abiding in us as a branch and we know how to rightly divide the word of truth, then the desires that we would ask of the Lord would be in line with scripture because the fulfillment of the scripture meets our desire. And then by this, God is glorified. When Satan was tempting Jesus and Jesus responded, for it is written, God was glorified. Jesus expressed his desire when he said, away from me, Satan, for it is written. So God was glorified by meeting Jesus's desire. I hope you're getting this. So too many times we pray and ask amiss and then we blame God. So take the time to examine, are your desires aligning with scripture? Are your desires the result of the word of God dwelling on the inside of you? Are you praying more for your child's occupation than their salvation? Because which one is aligned with the word? And yes, the Lord gives us the desires of our heart. So too often our desires are amiss if it's not being fueled by having the word of God abiding on the inside of us. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Sadly, we could pull up so many songs that are being presented as spiritual, but when you listen to the song, you can tell that the writer and or the performer, that the word is not dwelling in them richly. You can go on YouTube, you can go on Instagram, and you can hear people presenting wisdom, presenting teaching, attempting to admonish, but do you hear the word dwelling in them richly? Because if you have the word inside of you, the word of God will recognize the word of God because it's all one canon. And I'm not saying just being able to recite from memory because memory is actually at the bottom. If you was to look at frameworks that measure learning and critical thinking, memorization is at the bottom. The top of it is being able to actually evaluate, which means place value, to be able to critically think, to be able to explain and expound. So you have a lot of people that will attempt to amaze you by what it is that they've memorized. But do they live fruit that is the realization of what it is that they are presenting to impress you with their memorization? So you can dwell on that. So when it says that the word of Christ to dwell in you richly, richly means in abundance. In Psalms 23, where it talks about my cup runneth over. We are to have more than enough to share with others because God will send people our way who are hurting, who are confused who need a word, but they're not even awoke enough to understand that what they need is a word until you give them the word and then it triggers something in their spirit and then they become hungry and they want more. And that's the beauty of the power of what has been written. Don't try to get in front of the Holy Spirit and do his job. Present the word. God will do the rest. God will move off of his word. 
So don't minister or teach or have conversation to try to get the emotion, to try to get the call and response, because then you run the risk of being performative. When you study the scriptures, I can't find a place where Jesus was preaching and teaching to get an applause. He was presenting the word of God and he was presenting it in power and demonstration. And then he called the disciples and gave them that same power and authority. And if you look in Acts 2, after the coming of the Holy Spirit, Peter came out and gave his sermon. He didn't give his opinion. He gave the word of God and thousands came. Think about what's happening now that we're coming up with marketing schemes and doing all of these tricks and trickery to try to bring them in. Let the word of God do what the word of God is supposed to do. Because if you are saved and you're listening to this, if you take a moment and reflect back, you might have heard great songs. You might have been at amazing services. But what made you make that decision? was nothing but the word of God that made you realize that I am a sinner and I have fallen short of your glory. And I believe that according to Romans 10, 9 and 10, that Jesus, you are the risen son of God. And I'm going to confess that with my mouth, which is scripture. And I'm going to believe it in my heart, which is scripture. And then by that, I'm going to have faith to know that I'm saved, which is scripture. And then the scripture goes on to tell us that if an evil father or evil man knows how to give a good gift to his child, how much greater of a gift would God give us? So then by faith upon receiving salvation by grace, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And so now I believe that I am filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't have to speak tongues in this moment. I don't have to fall out and roll on the floor this moment. I believe what the word of God says. And then as I continue to build upon the word of God, the Holy Spirit will take me to Galatians 5, 22 and 23 and explain the nine manifestations of the Holy Spirit. I'm challenging you to go and read that for yourself. So when you read those nine manifestations, that becomes the characteristic. And so that becomes the proof of being filled with the Holy Spirit. More so than what I can do from a performative standpoint, it's the fact that I'm long suffering. It's the fact that I'm operating in love. It's the fact that I'm operating in self-control. That is the proof. And then the further verifier is that it aligns with scripture. Here are some more examples of the power of what has been written. John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, He will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Look at what happens when you keep the word of God. When you keep the word of God, the father comes and then the son comes and they dwell on the inside of you. And the Holy Spirit begins to do the work inside of you. And then you continue to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. And then you begin to renew your mind and you transform from the old man to the new man. And all of that is being done by keeping the word of God. How many times have we confessed that we love God, but we're not keeping his word. We say that we love him, but we're not keeping his commandments. But then the fact is that even when we fall short, his mercy is daily. He's long suffering. Even that is in the word. There's no condemnation for those who believe. So when the enemy tries to guilt you into not thinking that God will forgive you, when the people around you who've seen your shortcoming will look at you and be like, who are you to think that you still can operate on the foundation because I know you did this and I know you did that. Well, then let's go to the scriptures. And it talks about God being not slack in his promises because he's long suffering because his desire and his will is for all to be saved. 
And then we can go to the scriptures where it tells us that he's a compassionate high priest. So he understands what it means to be in this flesh, but yet not sin. And so how can we ever come close to that? It is by understanding the power of what has been written. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Think about everything that is going on. Where are you finding patience? Where are you finding comfort? And where are you finding hope? I'm offering you, not my opinion. I'm offering you the scriptures. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every work. Let the work of God begin in you by you partaking in the scriptures, letting the scriptures bring the reproof, bring the correction. Because also as you study the scriptures, you'll understand that to be chastened by God is actually a way that he shows us love so that we can be counted as sons. Hebrews 4 and 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. It is a multi-billion dollar industry to have therapists and counselors and practices to try to get you to know yourself. And I am not discounting the effective role that a therapist or a counselor can play. But I can tell you this, based upon Hebrews 4.12, if you allow your heart to be open, the word of God will reveal not only your position, it also will reveal your condition. And then if you decide to fully submit, then God will begin to restore you by that word. I want to give another example as I begin to close. Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm going to read verses 14 through 17. But the passage begins at verse 10 when it talks about the whole armor of God. So I'm going to begin at verse 14. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of of the spirit, which is the word of God. So you think about having your armor on. And yes, we have to have faith because Hebrews eleven six 6 tells us without faith, it's impossible to please God. We have to have faith in order to be saved. But imagine the shield in this context is the defense mechanism is blocking the fiery darts. If we go back to Matthew 4, at some point, Jesus, when he said, away, Satan, the defensive turned to the offensive, for it is written. So the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, we have to have our sword, meaning that we have to have our word to be able to go on the attack. Yes, the shield of faith will block those fiery darts. But there are times that you can see the enemy coming. And yes, we are to pray without ceasing, but then we are to pray with the word of God. So the act of praying the word of God actually becomes our sword. So at some point, you have to decide that you're tired of certain fiery darts always being the same thing. 
I'm tired of jealousy. I'm tired of envy. I'm tired of being reminded of the mistakes of my past. I'm tired of walking around feeling like a victim when the scriptures tells me that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. When the scriptures tell me I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. So at some point, it's not enough for me to just shield the fiery darts. It's time for me to take that sword. And to take that sword and be able to stand. That intercessor has that sword. That teacher has that sword. If you are a parent and you have a child, that yes, you want to have that shield of faith. But you need to spiritually and maybe even physically walk around your house with that sword. You may need to go into certain parts of that house and begin to speak that word. And I'm not talking about being hyper and illusionary, but if there are certain parts of your home where you have people living there and you know they're not serving the Lord, you just going to sit there and hope it away or you going to begin to speak the word? Are you going to begin to do like Joshua said, as for me and my house, we going to serve the Lord? Are you going to begin to bring to the remembrance of that child Proverbs 22 and 6, letting them know how they were raised? Are you going to begin to use that sword to help the scales be removed from their eyes so that they can understand that the scriptures say bad company corrupts good habits? I want to close by touching on two scriptures. I'm going to reference 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, because that verse tells us to fight the good fight of faith. And in Romans 10, 17, it reveals that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And a lot of times I've heard people recite it wrong. It says hearing by the word of God. The word of God actually has the power to cause us to hear the voice of God. And in Luke 24, 44 and 45, when Jesus had risen and he was talking to the disciples, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And this is verse 45. Then he opened their mind so they could understand the scriptures. So the word of God opens up for us to hear. Jesus Desire is to open our mind to understand the scriptures. In Proverbs, it tells us that knowledge is the principal thing, but in all you're getting, get understanding. This is Minister Timothy Jones. Thank you for fellowshipping with us in the word. And it is my prayer that you will begin to understand the power of what has been written. God bless you. We appreciate your continued support. If you would like to make a donation or pay your tithes and offering, please go to tbwc.org slash give. Join us every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. online or on Facebook. It is our pleasure to introduce our new online Christian education program, The Believer's Bible Institute. Registration is now open for individuals interested in furthering their knowledge of the Word of God. Please visit bbitbwc.com for more information and to view our current course offerings. Jesus said, Come unto me. Join us for prayer every Friday at 7 p.m. You can submit a prayer request by emailing us at prayer at tbwc.org.